it's um, a joy and an honor to be here to, to have the, um, the, the hey, I'm the uh, eighth, uh, no, the, I'm a successor to the eight previous Henry Hope Reed um, laureates. And particularly because in his pioneering book, uh, The Golden City of 1959, Henry Hope Reed not only denounced modernism, but was also positive in predicting a return to what he called the golden city of the American Renaissance with its combination of classical architecture, sculpture, and painting. If this then seemed somewhat over-optimistic, evidence of such a return um, is shown in this capriccio that I'm showing you now by the great Karl Lorbin, a kind of golden city in itself, showing work by architects whom I have supported and am honored to count as friends. And I'm delighted that Carl is with us today to help present the great picture that some of you will have seen last night and will see later on today of the, the laureates. I've written many books on architecture, but only one book on a painter. Uh, the, my problem is that I really only like paintings if they've got buildings in them. And of course, with Carl Lorbin, there's precious little else. He's the ideal painter, and I'm very grateful um, that um, Paul Doyle, an architectural patron who um, is here um, with me from London to, to celebrate, and it was he who commissioned the painting you see before you from, for me from Carl Lorbin and, and gave it to me. Carl ingeniously displays um, the images of buildings and designs uh, in this beautiful golden yellow room. Uh, and this room that you can see with its segmental arches and those remarkable um, open oculi in them, this is a recreation recently done in Cambridge by John Simpson in place of the room by John Soane of 1792 on exactly this site and taking this form, but it had been demolished in 1850 uh, with little record made. Um, so here is his recreation of that room and you can see it, it's filled with models and drawings of um, recent buildings. Here's the room recreated by um, John Simpson and one of the sources in antiquity of those remarkable arches with the light coming through, which was so much a feature of Soane's architecture. Soane uh, uh, took this uh, from the now ruined Nymphium by Bramante um, at Genazzano uh, near, near Rome. Uh, Here is uh, Simpson's chimney piece in this room at Keyes College, Cambridge, um, and a detail of some of the beautiful uh, plaster work. Looking back at the painting, you can see at the back of the painting there is a painting within a painting, as it were, hanging on the wall below the great yellow glass segmental window. And here, Carl has ingeniously created a city square, an imaginary one, but composed on the three sides that you see of buildings uh, put up. Uh, um, on on the, the, the left range, uh, towards the back on the left is a long range in Old Church Street, Chelsea, uh, by John Simpson. Along the back is this run of buildings by Quill and Terry in, in Baker Street. One of the tremendous battles we had to fight to get permission to do this, um, objected to by every possible body you can think of extraordinarily, um, took about 20 years to get permission uh, for it. Uh, here's a detail. Um, with one of the models, of course, Palladio, but this building was a recreation by Quinlan Terry of a building that had been nearby and had been demolished after the war. So one of the aims of architects now is to repair the damages done by modernist doctrines to wreck our historic uh, towns. 
Um, back to Lorbin's painting, you can see in the middle, below the painting within a painting in the background, Leon Creer's wonderful, the model of his ideal city of Atlanta. And to the right of that uh, is a smaller model of Thomas Hope's house of the 1820s, the Deep Dean. And this model was made by Thomas Gordon Smith and his students at the Notre Dame School of Architecture from my exhibition on Thomas Hope in New York and London in 2008, a model which Thomas very generously gave to me afterwards. Uh, below the uh, model of Leo Creer's Atlantis um, are three paintings propped up, and these are of buildings, uh, buildings in Colonial Williamsburg by Quill and Terry. On the extreme right in the foreground um, is a, a rather frightening bust of me um, by the brilliant sculptor Sandy Stoddart, which he generously gave me to, to thank me for obtaining for him the commission for the sculpture in the Queen's Gallery at Buckingham Palace by John Simpson, of which you see the bright green copper roof in this painting just to the right of the painting within the painting in the background. And here is um, uh, the entrance to that building by John Simpson, the Queen's Gallery, Buckingham Palace, um, on an awkward site, rather like that of the Erechtheum on the Acropolis, um, as you can see by this juxtaposition of those two buildings. The entrance portico is in the uh, 6th century Greek Doric um, of the Temple of Hera at Pistum, and it prepares us for the um, Sandy Stoddart's figured friezes in the entrance hall within, which is based on a Homeric theme of the, of the 8th century. Um, and on the right, the entrance hall, um, leading um, the staircase, which opens up from the entrance hall. I had the privilege of sitting on the Driehaus jury with um, Tom Beebe, so I'm delighted to congratulate him as well. And meeting in the Villa Aurelia on the Janiculum in Rome in October 2004, we chose with pleasure Quinlan Terry as the winner of the Driehaus Award for 2005. And we also asked Richard Driehaus if he would create a second award for someone not an architect, but who had promoted in other ways the cause of classical and traditional architecture and city planning. And we had in mind the strong claims of Henry Hope Reed for such an award. And with characteristic generosity, uh, Richard Inson immediately agreed. So in 2005, Henry Hope Reed became the first winner of the award appropriately named after him. And it went in the next year to David Morton from the publishing house of Rizzoli, also with us today, to whom I'm also indebted as the publisher of my first book on Queen of Terry in 2006 and my second in 2014 and my second book on John Simpson in 2015. <laughs> I just can't stop writing. Um, when Henry Hopes reads um, The Golden City, it was published in this enlarged edition in 1971. I had just emerged from being a PhD pupil, as Leo has mentioned, of Nikolaus Pevsner, the most influential promoter in England of modernism, which he saw as the only moral way that modern man, and he believed there was such a thing, could be allowed to express himself truthfully in architecture. And I tried to break this moralizing straight jacket in morality in architecture in 1977, but was then unfortunately unaware of Henry Hope Reed's wonderful book, of which there was, of course, no copy in the library of the Cambridge School of Architecture, or probably in any of the other schools in England at that time. I was very shocked. Um, that Pevsner claimed in his book, Outline of European Architecture, that, I quote, the Greek temple and the Roman forum 
are part of antiquity but do not belong to what we usually mean when we speak of European civilization. I had this absurd view in mind when I published my own book on the Roman Forum in 2009, pointing out, amongst other things, how much modern architects could learn from it. But it was a miracle for me, nurtured by Pevsner, gradually to find allies who did not believe that life began with the Bauhaus, perhaps almost ended with it. And these, of course, were first Quill and Terry, um, and here a beautiful recent house by him in my uh, monograph on him, Fern Park, then, of course, Dimitri Porfirios, both Driehaus Prize winners, like Leon Crea, a huge influence on all of us, and these were soon joined in England by John Simpson, uh, by Bob Adam, and uh, here's a remarkable house, um, Ashley Park by Bob Adam, uh, and Hugh Petter, Liam O'Connor, Craig Hamilton, Francis Terry, George Summers Smith, and others, perhaps not yet widely known in this room, but all potential Driehaus Award winners, so look out. I've been able to write books, articles, essays, reviews on each of these architects, sometimes even helping them gain commissions, and have um, sent many statements of support for their buildings to local planning authorities who had refused planning consent, as with this house, Ashley Park, by Adam, who when he and Hugh Petter went, uh, were making an addition to the British school in Rome, um, by Lutyens, they were told by a planning officer in Rome that you cannot add any classical parts to any building in Rome. They must be frankly modern, that terrifying phrase. So we still have a long way to go. In defending the work of Adam and the other architects I've named, I've been cross-examined by lawyers when such battles have been taken to the level of public inquiries. But at the Georgian Group, of which I'm one of the two vice chairmen, we have established annual awards for new classical buildings. Sadly, unlike the Driehaus Awards, these do not come with the lavish prize, indeed with no prize at all, except glory. Um, and here um, are two recent classical buildings that we have given these awards to. They were the only body in England, and I imagine in Europe, to give awards to new classical buildings. But like the Driehaus Awards, they are ignored in England by the, uh, the architectural establishment and architectural journals. So on the left, you see this beautiful infirmary, an addition by Quill and Terry, right next to Wren's Royal Hospital at Chelsea. Put up in the face of massive opposition, this building, from the leading modernist architect, Richard Rogers, now Lord Rogers, and others. So we gave that a prize, and also the adjacent building you see here by the young George Somerville Smith, trained in Quill and Terry's office. Uh, this is a gallery for an art dealer in Bond Street uh, next to Sotheby's. I urge Westminster Council um, City Council Planning Department to permit this, though it required the demolition of a small Georgian building on its site in the Mayfair Conservation Area, which is supposed to be preserved as it is. But I was quite happy for a poor Georgian building to be replaced by a good modern classical building. It hints as a design at two of my favorite architects, John Soane and C.R. Cockerell, and woven across it is a figured Grecian frieze by Sandy Stoddart with a theme from the Odyssey. So echoing the claim of C.R. Cockerell in the 1820s that sculpture is the voice of architecture. Pericles wisely put the sculptor Phidias in general charge of his buildings on the Acropolis, and major Greek buildings were often designed by famous sculptors of the human body in bronze or stone, hence the analogy between the body and the orders. Doric, the man, Ionic, the woman, Corinthian, the girl, as in the two 
16th century figures we're looking at here, a male figure um, carrying a triglyph on his head. His head almost merges into the triglyph of the male Doric order, as, as Vitruvius claimed. And uh, this is at the Palazzo Spada in Rome. And on the right, the female figure of a winged victory um, with acanthus leaves of the Corinthian order merging into her hair and dress. This is by Jean Goujon in the Cour Carré at the Louvre, both showing how the classical orders have always been seen as imitating or expressing the forms of the character of the human body, which is why I believe they're so timeless, as indeed classical ornament is timeless based as it is on natural plant forms. The classical language is ignored by archaeologists who believe that the older a building or object is, the more interesting it is. This is a baneful outlook which became clear to me really only when writing my recent book on the Roman Forum. And I realized that archaeologists, like modernist architects, have a narrow agenda with a moralizing belief in what they see as truth or authenticity, which excludes beauty. For me, for me, unlike for archaeologists or modernists, both 16th century sculpture, like what we're looking at here, and classical buildings of antiquity are not more authentic and more interesting than ones of the present day, like the beautiful buildings in another painting by Karl Laubin, with which I now end, showing buildings now rising by John Simpson at Eton College. Um, where this is a composite picture um, with the four sides of the great quad shown like sort of salami slices on top of each other. And this great project shows how though we still have a long way to go, the renewal of the Golden City has been more successful than Henry Hope Reed could have guessed 40 years ago. Thank you. <laughs>